Hi, everyone. My name is Lucian. Most of you know me from Twitter as Triangle Investor. I'm glad to have a special guest today, a guest that I have a big respect for, a guest that knows a lot about uranium, and that is Mr. Mike Alkin, uh, Chief Investment Officer at Sachem Cove Partners. Mike, thank you for coming to my show. Hi, Lucian. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mike. Uh, although a lot of my viewers know who are you, I would like to ask you that you give us an introduction. Uh, so who is Mike Alkin? Uh, how did you end up in uranium and what attracted you to it? I mean, the, the accidental uranium investor. Um, I, 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 my career was spent in the hedge fund industry as an analyst and then eventually as a, as a senior partner at a large uh, hedge fund um, for a number of years. Um, my, my, I started out in the middle latter part of the nineties as a short seller at a, at a short selling hedge fund. So we were looking for companies that were, we thought had, um, maybe bad management teams, poor business prospects, maybe a little bit of both. Um, and, uh, we, we would do our own field work. So we didn't really listen to what wall street said, their analysts, except to try and understand what their expectations were, but we did our own work. And uh, I did that for a number of years. And uh, it was really a great lesson in terms of doing your own primary research, modeling your own, modeling the companies on your own, not getting just sell side models and using them, yeah. um, talking to people in the industry versus talking to management teams and just analysts. Uh, so it was a, a very good experience for for doing your own analysis. Um, and then uh, I looked at all sorts of industries over many years. Uh, and, and what I learned over the years was, you know, when you're a generalist investor, uh, sometimes you feel you come into a new industry and it can be a little bit overwhelming because you're trying to learn everything. But what you realize over time is one of the things in investing that I think hurts investors who are expert at something yeah. is is a recency bias. A, they get caught up in what was, and, they, and especially whether something's been in a really long bull market or long bear market, they get caught up in the moment. And they, it's hard to see outside of that. And when you come into an industry with a fresh perspective, as long as you come in knowing there's a lot you don't know and need to learn, yeah. um, you can look at things a little bit differently. And sometimes you can catch inflection points or near inflection points. So anyway, over over the years, I've looked I've looked at everything from consumer to material, natural resources, energy, you name it. Um, and that was uh, to, by 2015. I, I've said this so many times uh, before, but my 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 daughter was ill, and she, we we didn't know what that was like, uh, where that would go. And and I had um, had a long run as a, as a partner at a firm for a long time, and I I, I just decided it was time to be dad and not travel all the time and be home. And after, thank God for after some period of time, my daughter uh, got better. Our outlook was clearer on it. And uh, thank God. I was, and I, yeah, thank you. And and I, I just decided it was time to, my wife basically said, all right, you drive me crazy around the house. So figure something out. And, and uh, but, but I, uranium, I, 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 my, my, my stock and trade as a short seller is your contrarian. And on the long side, for many years after being just a short seller, looking at deep value, was always looking at things that were out of favor. And um, had looked at uranium a few times back in at the peak in 07 and in 2011 after Fukushima and uh, decided we were busy with other stuff and just didn't have the time and and want to put the effort into getting to know it. But in 20 uh, late 2015, early 2016, I was I was home. I, the outlook for my, my daughter was getting better. And I was just investing my own money. And I I look for things, like I said, that were deeply out of favor and uranium fit that bill. It was down 90%. The commodity was, the stocks were destroyed. Um, as I started sniffing around, uh, looking on the sell side, what research there was, what the modeling looked like, it was really dated. Um, so, you know, Fukushima happened, a meltdown occurred in March of 2011. So here we are almost four or five years later, if you were a uranium only analyst, you probably lost your job you, or you might have morphed into a, a uh, at an investment bank, you became a, a precious metals or a base metals analyst. So the research that was out there for investors was very sparse. 
there were very little institution. There was very little institutional ownership of the companies. Um, and it was kind of left for dead. And <clears throat> I didn't, I said, you know, this is intriguing to me, but let me come at it through the eyes of a short seller. If, if I can prove the bear case, uh, then maybe I'll just, you know, forget it all. What, why I wasted a little bit of time, big deal. And so I said, let me, let me see how it squares with, you know, what was the prevailing case at the time? It was, oh, alternative energy, wind and solar are going to eat nuclear's lunch. You don't need it anymore. For the greens that were out there, it was all going that way. Yeah. Um, and so I knew a little bit about wind and solar, but enough to be dangerous. So uh, I didn't really know it that well. So I, as, as I started to, to, to spend time understanding the, the nuances of, of alternative energy and understanding nuclear's role and its base load, its reliant. It, I was surprised to learn how safe it was. So it was a learning experience for me. And on the alternative energy side with wind and solar, again, coming at it with no biases whatsoever, you know, it's it, it has its place, it's intermittent, but it doesn't work a lot. It costs a lot to store it. You know, that was five, six, six seven years ago. And here we are, six, eight years ago, gosh, and you're still there. Um, and so I thought, well, it's, it has a it has a role, but why is the world thinking that everything's going alternative? It's it's not happening, and uh, and uh, conversely, oil and gas aren't going away anytime soon. So it was with that lens that I said, well, I I don't really see that the case for uh, nuclear is just disappearing. Um, I don't get that. So I said, let me just take a fresh look at at the demand side and the supply side, and start from scratch. Put open up a spreadsheet and put down a list of all the reactors and you first have to learn, you know, how many reactors, uh, how many, how many pounds does one reactor use, right? It's basic stuff. Um, what goes into making a pound of uranium? And then you learn the fuel cycle. Is there anything along that fuel cycle that can mean you use more or less uranium? And then, you know, you stumble upon enrichment and you learn that enrichment math can dictate how much uranium is actually used. So you can't just say there's X number of reactors times X number of pounds. That X number of pounds depends on how much enrichment capacity. So that was a, you know, that was a learning experience for me and a lot of trial and error, a lot of trying to figure it out, but bringing an analytical lens to it. And then I started getting out in the field, talking to fuel buyers. I started going to nuclear industry events and, uh, and I would say, Hey, hi, here's who I am. I know enough to be dangerous. Um, <laughs> But I'm just trying to learn. And, you know, that day it's a 2017-ish, 2016. Yeah, 16 and 17, trying to understand the industry better. And uh, so once, but, but you know, there's 30 countries that produce nuclear power at the time. And so it wasn't overly complicated. You get a list of all the reactors, how large they are. You understand the enrichment math. You understand how much each reactor is more or less going to use. And then you start looking about what countries that these reactors are in have an attitude that they want to either reduce nuclear power, keep it the same, or increase it. And then you just make some 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 estimates. And when I did all that, I said, okay, let's now at that time, the attitude towards nuclear was not positive. It was uh, so the United States, the largest user of nuclear power, there were you had a lot of closures looking into the future. Uh, South Korea. Um, that it was kind of on the wane. You were seeing a, a, a big consumer of nuclear power. You were seeing a reduction in dependency. Japan, there was no sign that anything was coming back online. A very big user. Japan yeah. was 13% of world demand when Fukushima happened and they mostly all went offline. Um, the UK, another big consumer was reducing. France, three quarters of France's electricity comes from nuclear. At that time, they were looking to reduce it to 50% or starting to get into that time period. So. The yeah, outlook right. wasn't the, right. The outlook wasn't rosy, and so I put all that on paper, and I started to learn about enrichment, the tails of enrichment, how all that stuffs work, and how much. When I say tails, meaning uh, how much enrichment, how much uranium is going to be needed at different enrichment levels, and um, I got all that done, and I was like, "Wow, this is not a declining industry. It's not much of a growth industry, but it's not declining much." Um, consensus, I, I say consensus, really at that time point, consensus is basically a consulting firm that did a forecast. The, the investment banks didn't really have anything. They were cutting and pasting that stuff. So I thought, well, that's wrong because you know the narrative is nuclear is dying. It's not dying. And then it was really a matter of saying, okay, well, what's supply look like? 
Um, again, the several month endeavor, get a list of all the mines, what's it cost to produce, look at the technical reports. I'm not a geologist, but you know enough to, to know that. And if you know what you don't know, you know how to go find that. Um, but look, you just try and understand what it costs to pull out and what the market thought the cost to pull out. And what you realize is what jumps off the page at you when you're looking at uranium is that, you know, a little bit more than half of the capacity for what the demand levels were at that time. And, um, are from state-owned entities, mostly state-owned and a little bit of uh, major mines that have byproduct, made one particular one uh, that has a byproduct that's uranium. And so where, where cost is really whatever they want it to be, they could sell it for a dollar if they wanted to. They didn't. Like, I think the number was 115 million pounds of capacity at that time that I was looking, and maybe 75% um, was actually being produced, maybe 80%, depending on the year. So price did matter. But if you said, okay, let's say it doesn't, like the market would say, oh, it's a state-owned entity, they don't care. Um, you still had a lot of pounds that required profit. And from, from pure play uranium miners that need a profit. And as I started going through that, I started to say, wait a second, I was looking at the cost curve. Obviously, it all starts and ends with the cost curve, right? So what, what's cost curve look like? Well, the first 115 million pounds get taken care of by that, but it's really you know, I don't know, 80, 90 million pounds that's going to be produced, but let's say 115, who's next? And then who's next? And then it doesn't take long before you're like, wait a second. I added in the secondary supply, the above ground inventories, the, the, the reused uranium, uh, uh, the uh, 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 underfeeding that was occurring, some other things where you're like, okay, I'm adding this all up. Um, the, the mines that are in production, and even I th think I can make a case for some of the mines that are not in production, and I've spoken about this publicly back then, so it wasn't like I'm saying it now. You can go look at it on YouTube, but what I was talking about in 2017, um, yeah. there's, there's too much supply. Um, supply needs to, to go down. And um, so you needed to see supply cuts. And because you, one of the things I noticed that really stood out to me was the lead industry forecaster, who shall go nameless, just why not? Um, uh, but they're an industry consultant and forecaster. And if you were to look at their, their cost curve back in 2010, 2011, in different reports that they put out, they would reference the cost curve. And their cost curve really focused on an, kind of an all-in sustaining cost, uh, more than just the cash cost at the mine level. Yeah. And, and it made sense, right? It also required a profit. And that makes sense because when you're doing that, these are pure play uranium miners. They, it's not a multi-commodity multi miner that can offset. They could run on a cash cost. They have other projects that can offset it. This, you either make money or you lose money. And you can't lose money for too long. So, But that cost curve, as time wore on, after the the meltdown at Fukushima and Japan's 13% came offline, all those reactors, as price started imploding in uranium, the, the cost curve from the forecaster started reflecting a cash cost. So in their supply demand models, they were showing out through like 2030, let's say, supply based on a, a cash cost that would always show these mines running. And that just was illogical to me. I thought that's that's ivory tower stuff. That's theoretical stuff. That's not how the real world works. Companies that, re, that have investors, companies that require capital and need to go ask investors for capital when they produce uranium, they can't sell it for a loss very long before the producer, before companies, uh, investors will get pissed yeah. off, right? All of that. And so it was then that I realized, wait a second, Nuclear, the narrative on the demand side is is too aggressively inc incorrect. It's not declining. It's growing a little bit. Uh, and on the supply side, you need to see supply cuts. And so, um, the, but, but the numbers didn't reflect that. The numbers reflected surplus as far as the eyes could, could see. And then by 2017, throughout 17, you start to see supply cuts. You eventually got to 25% of global supply got cut. Um, and demand has done a 180 since then. And so, you know, I, we can go wherever you want with that. But that was that was the impetus for me. That's how I got started. I didn't, I am not a uranium expert. I was not a uranium expert. I've been in the market for, you know, looking at it for eight years. I've 
I, I think I have a good knowledge of it. Uh, I, I don't like, I, I don't know what expert means. Um, the experts I know in this space are the reasons the opportunity exists because the experts are the fuel buyers. They're brilliant. They're nuclear engineers. They're also the same people who told me at $18, there was plenty of uranium. They'd never go up. At 25, it wouldn't go up. At 30, it wouldn't go up. At 40, it wouldn't go up. Yeah. So here we are. Yeah, Mike, uh, you covered the last 10 years. Uh, that's great. Uh, but uh, let's go to present and in the future. Uh, sure. Can you tell me uh, about supply and demand? Where are we now with supply and demand? And where are we going if we take a time frame by the end of the decade? decade? Yeah, so you know it all. The it all there. You'll hear terms deficits, right? And I've had some people say to me, "Well, if there were deficits, how come prices haven't gone crazy?" Well, let's let's just step back and prices bottomed in at the end of uh, roughly late sixteen, early seventeen at eighteen dollars, seventeen, eighteen dollars, and here we are today, right? There's two prices that people reference: the spot price, which is sitting at around fifty-eight and a half dollars. It's gotten as high as 64 during the Ukraine initial stages of the war. Yes. Um, uh, so it's more than tripled. Um, this year, it's the number one commodity. I believe it's the number one commodity. It's up 20%, which flies in the face of the investor narrative, which when's it going to move, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Consider what's moving. Um, so, and then there's the long-term price. And the long-term price is a very important price because 80, 85% of the time, that's where uranium trades. Yes. And the reason it trades there, right, because um, there's no substitute for uranium. It's not like you are, in, you're not a utility that has a gas in a, in a coal-fired plant. You can switch back and forth based on prices and supply levels. That doesn't work in uranium. So therefore, they want security of supply. Uh, the cost of uranium is, uh, you know, the front end of the fuel cycle, all the stages are 20, 25%. The uranium is 5, 7, 8, 10% depending on the price, coal or natural gas, it's 80 to 90% that feedstock, right? So uh, the it's needed. There's no substitute. People pay what they have to pay when they're going to pay it. Um, on the, so so that's, that's how we think about, and the term price is sitting um, here today around the same price as the, the spot price. Uh, if you, but in contracts, in these long-term contracts, seven, eight, nine, 10 plus years, uh, there's language in those. There's different types. There's market related. There's base escalated. Um, but if you were to get a contract uh, right now and a utility, a, a producer wants market related because they want it to go as high as possible. But you would see right now that there are ceilings in these contracts written in the $80, $85 range. Right. Yes. So a utility is willing to pay up to that. And, and you could get floors in the mid 50s. So a few dollars down and huge upside, right? So there's asymmetrical risk reward. 18, 24 months ago, that was the opposite, right? So that's where you are right now. Um, however, it's important to understand for those listeners or viewers that are learning the market that the, the price reporting is, is, a, is a different creature. Um, it's in, in a spot market, it's the midpoint of the bid and the ask. It's not necessarily done on a trade. Right. So it's at the end of the day, right, this is very archaic. At the end of the day, three brokers call the price reporter and give them a price. There may have been a transaction, there's not, but it's the midpoint of where the bid and the ask moved. Um, on the on the contract side, it, it's 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 very bizarre because the, the price reporter chooses the lowest offered price on a transaction. So if a handful of producers were bidding to win business. And the utility chose a higher price. Uh, the producer, uh, the price reporter, reports the lowest offer and yeah. lowest bid. Right? That's not where it transacted. So that's that to us is just nonsensical. Um, and so the, the prices we would argue are are uh, uh, several dollars higher today. Um, so when we think about supply demand, you know, there and we talk about deficits and we, you, you know. Uh, a, a year, you think of dog years, it moves quickly in uranium. You're in 2030 tomorrow, right? So as we think about what's su what's supply look like and what's demand look like, you know, pick 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 a number on supply, 140, 150, 160. Um, you know, you're, uh, depending on, on when some projects come online. Um, but 
your secondary supply number has been a big number the last several years. So I'm talking primary supply on the on the on the 140 to 150 to 160. Um, on the secondary market, there has been a lot of inventory drawdown since 2012. And so there were years, right? If you look at the way the forecaster, the main, the largest forecast, the big forecaster produces their supply demand model, they show uh, supply, uh, primary mine supply, new supply, and then secondary supply. Yeah. And then they show demand. As part of that secondary supply, they show an inventory drawdown number. Well, all that number is, is a plug number that helps them try to balance the market, right? So if you look at their work going back several years, you would see that, and I don't have, I'm, I'm ballparking, in 2018 for the years, uh, or 2016 for the years 2019, 2021, you know, what could have looked like for the those years, a 12 to 14 to $16 million drawdown, by the time you got to those years, they were showing $56 million drawdown. So you'd look at the model and say, oh, well, it's kind of balanced. Well, yeah, but that's because they're drawing, in, they're pulling inventories out of the market. Why does that matter? Inventory has a price. The mobility of that inventory, it's it, 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 as, as prices rise, inventory becomes more dear. It, it's not the other way around. And so when you look at supply and demand, the way this industry accounts for it and is forecasted, it, it, our view is it's flawed. The market determines the inventory drawdowns. The market determines the price at which inventory is drawn down. And so when we look at uh, over the year, the, the last several years, secondary uh supply, you know, you would look at something called underfeeding. Underfeeding is when there's too much enrichment capacity that the enrichers can basically create their own uranium mine. And yeah. that was, you know, 20-ish million pounds a year. You'd see some Russian stockpiles come in between uh, uh, some Russian underfeeding, some Russian government stockpiles, maybe another 8 million pounds. Some mixed oxide fuel would be 7, 8 million pounds. So you're at 15, you're at 20, 35 million, and then you would get inventory drawdowns. That was a moving target coming out of the forecaster. So it, it always expanded, but it expanded because there was a deficit. And how do we know there was a deficit? Because prices rose. And, and what happens when there's not enough of something? Prices go higher, right? It's basic 101 stuff. So, so as we look to the future, when we do our supply demand modeling now, overfeeding, uh, I'm sorry, underfeeding, where there's too much capacity, the enricher can create a mine. We think that ultimately goes to what's called overfeeding. When there's too little capacity, they need to use more uranium to make the same amount required for a reactor to run without getting into the details. That We think that's a 20 million pound uh, draw and demand that's needed. So a 40 million pound swing there. So when we look at supply demand out through 2030, you know, depending on enrichment levels, and I don't want to get too into the weeds here, but, you know, we could see deficits that range anywhere from 20 million to 50 million pounds, right? We, we don't see surpluses per annum I'm talking yeah. about. Um, and so, again, it all depends on enrichment levels, but it's certainly far greater than consensus would think right now. Um, and, you know, our, our bet against consensus for the last five years has worked out okay. And we're continuing that bet. So, you know, the the, the other thing, too, is, you know, you see supply is 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 tricky and just in the last month or six weeks there have been two projects that were expected to come on this summer one this summer and one next year uh one is you know, once uh you know global atomic stock has gotten crushed right yeah. by a, a coup in this year and a few other things the next thing you know the stock's down that's they're, they're i don't think any i don't think tomorrow that thing's becoming a mine not saying it won't be but but if you're a utility doing deals, you got to now the timing is off. The same thing with Peninsula Energy. Peninsula Energy had a mine schedule to start uh, producing and processing here in the last month, in the next month or so, that there was a problem with the product, the processor chose not to process for them, and the stock gets cut in half. Well, that supply is not coming online. So supply is perilous. So um, new mines, you know, there's, a, there's the mines in development, it takes a lot longer typically to get a new mine online. So so when we look at the structural deficits ranging to 20, and again, we can, our model's pretty built out and we can plug and play enrichment levels and get to all different scenarios. We see a structural deficit. So now the question becomes, what triggers the deficit? What triggers this, like the everyone wants prices to go bananas? Well, it, it comes down to 
understanding the role of uh, contracting to consumption. And, and it's an important concept, I think, um, because uh, when you contract on an annual basis, replace what you've used, you're contracting to your consumption rate. When there's too much inventory in the system, you don't really feel like you have to. And so in looking at any and studying any industry, history is really important to understand. So if you look at the uranium industry and you go back to like the late, uh, the early 1990s, you have to, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as to understand where the prior cycles, you know, the wall fell in what, 91-ish? Um, uh, and you had, the, the U.S. was concerned that there'd be a lot of uh, nuclear missiles um, winding up uh, on, on the black market. So the, the Americans and the Russians entered into agreement that from Mega, 1990, the Americans, the megawatts, exactly. They would down they would down blend the highly enriched uranium in, a, in an intercontinental ballistic missile, 1600 of them, at, down to low enriched uranium levels. Uh, they would they would down blend them, and then the U.S. would take that in, and that was you know 20 ish million pounds a year from 1993 to 2013. So if you're a U.S. utility, that's a nice off balance sheet asset you know that's sitting out there that you, you don't have to really worry about a lot of stuff. Uh, you use 50 million pounds a year, 20 million of it's coming in from that program. Yeah, so. Yeah. So you have that. And so what you started to see, and also remember, 86, you had Chernobyl. So you're fresh off of a nuclear scare. You've got excess supply coming into the market. There were other things that were causing excess supply. So now from 1993 up until about 2004, utilities were re not in any rush to contract. They were replacing about one third of the pounds they used in any given year. And so they're, what are they do? If they're doing that, what are they doing? They're drawing down secondary area. They're drawing down megatons pounds. They're drawing down inventory stockpiles, right? And the price of uranium was running at seven, eight, nine dollars for all those years. Then in 2000, it's sitting at around seven. And then in 2001, it's 12 or 14. Then it's 18 and it's slowly climbing. You get to 2005 and what had been contracting at 40, 50, 60 million pounds a year about it uh, uh, over those years, all of a sudden there was 250 million pounds contract, 240 million pounds contracting. And why? Because the market got to a level where inventories have been worn down. Uh, and it, even in the midst of the megatons, right in the heart of the megatons and megawatts, inventories were down and, and, and utilities started replacing, they needed to replace them. Bass, and now at that time, 05, the contracting starts, yeah, you know, your prices are in the 30s, and then 06 comes, and today there's a narrative in the market that the last cycle was kicked off because the world's largest uranium mine scheduled to come online for the first time in 07, flooded, and it never came online. All of that's true. The part that is factually incorrect based on the modeling at the time, and 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 it's not totally incorrect, but the price of uranium by that time was already well into the 40s from $7. So from 00 to 06, when the mine flooded, October of 06, yeah, or almost had a 7x increase in the price of uranium. That's a pretty strong bull market. When that mine flooded and it was found out that it wouldn't be able to come online for years, the world's biggest mine's not coming online. If you were a fuel buyer and we flayed out the numbers it's and we had, had slides on it, if you were a fuel buyer and you were looking before the flood and you looked out over a six year period, you would have seen that there was 125 million pounds of forecasted surplus in the market. That's in October of 06. And then all of a sudden the mine floods and you wait three months and you look to see what the forecaster has. And you look at those numbers, that would have been a 200 plus million, 225 million pound surplus. How? They dropped demand a little, they found new mine supply. But at the end of the day, there was that mine not coming online didn't mean there was less supply coming. There was actually, they showed more supply in the forecast, yet prices went from, you know, the high 40s into at 137 at one point. But that's not what, the, the bull market started at seven. It, it was 40 in the high 40s. So when we, you know, when we look at today, we as, as, as a parallel, since 2012, utilities have been contracting at 35, 6, 7% of annual consumption, very similar. They've been drawing down excess inventories. 
there's been a price associated with that because the price has gone from 18 to 58, right? So yeah. inventory is not free. And um, the difference is, as I said earlier, you know, you, you know, we look out at anywhere from 20 to 50 million pounds per annum of a deficit, but the, the forecaster shows a deficit. The forecaster was showing surpluses last time. So now, you know, you had uh, 20, 2022, you had probably 65% of annual consumption contracted versus what had been mid thirties. This year, we think it's, it, it surpasses that. And so that's where the rubber meets the road. How many economic pounds are available to meet demand? Um, the other thing too, that we think is important when you, when you look at forecast, when you're cons looking at consumption, when you're looking at demand, demand has many hats. There's the demand, uh, there's consumption, which is one for one, which is what we were just speaking about. But then using the, the tail levels, right? The capacity levels at the enrichment plant to, to, to keep it simple. Um, so that can add more pounds or subtract. We've gone through the subtraction stage. Now we think we're in the addition stage because of less capacity available because the geopolitical shifts as Russia's 45-ish percent of or uh, global enrichment capacity, that's gone to the West for the most part in the future, not they're still getting some, but in the future. Um, but, uh, you know, that's one bucket of demand. Um, but the other bucket, right, is in the last contracting cycle, they buy more than your annual consumption. So what number do you want to associate? You want to use 110% of annual consumption? That, that would be a reasonable number looking back at history. So, you know, if your demand numbers are in the 190s to 200s, you know, what's your what's your consumption? What's your recontracting, restocking the cupboards? Inventory levels in the West right now are below historical norms. In the in the US, they're below two years. In Western Europe, they're below three. Those are below their comfort levels. So they got to restock. Then you start to get into, oh, how much secondary demand from financial buyers are out there, right? You 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 have a a spot. You have new funds that are entering the mix. I don't know what the right pounds is. It's not a million pounds. It's probably more than that. Mm -hmm. And then you start to get in. You're you're asking through 2030. When do they start buying for any SMR demand? There's a little bit there. New reactors, reactors that were going to close that are now not closing. So demand has many different hats. Um, and I think as we look at the numbers, we think it gets underestimated. So, you know, we, we think there's a structural deficit of tens of millions of pounds per annum for the next several years. Uh, Mike, uh, would you say that the utilities are fully aware of the supply demand situation? I mean, uh, shouldn't we see a contracting at the full swing? I know that we have refueling cycles, but nevertheless, should we see a more contracting? Uh, I mean, uh, let's put it in a simple example. If you need a car and, I, and you have a money to buy it, and uh, I know that the price will go up eventually, and that is going to be a more difficult to find a new quality car. Shouldn't this be a good time to buy a good quality car at a good price? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I, I, I have to understand, um, you know, most fuel buyers who are sitting in these seats have seen mostly surpluses for many, many years, right? We just talked from the early 90s till you saw a few year period where there were deficits. So they're kind of a, they've always, you know, when I first started talking to them and looking at this, and I was asked to present by the Nuclear Energy Institute to a room full of fuel buyers back in 2019 and 2018, why consensus was wrong when the price was 18 and 20 and 22. And I laid out the math that's not too dissimilar, very similar here. Things change a little bit, but um, at, at that time, laid it out and um, it, at the National Nuclear Energy Institute, a large trade body, laid out the math. Here's why you guys have done a wonderful job staying out of the market. Here's why prices will rise. And I was told afterwards that basically I'm an outsider. I know I have no idea what I'm talking about and I'm wrong. And here we are. Prices have moved up three and a half X. Um, so they're, they're also, you know, they're not commercial creatures in the market every day. They do many important things at a nuclear power plant. Most of them are nuclear engineers. They're worried about many other things than just the price of uranium, a small portion. And they're not, I think importantly, they're not financially incentivized to get that right, right? So it's it's not a commercial, it's not oil, gas, it's coal, it's not that. And so they buying it at a good price 
isn't as important to them as they buying it at what everyone else is paying. And so we talked earlier about being a generalist, how it helps. They're mired in recency bias. Even though prices have gone up triple, if, if you look at the surveys that come out uh, twice a year from the industry forecaster going back 20, 20, 20 plus years, the price they forecast five years from today is always the is, is always a couple of dollars or three dollars or a little bit more from where it was wherever it is that time. It's just the nature. They're not commercial creatures. So are they aware of it? Yes. The price would dictate that, right? So now they're giving $80, $85, $90 ceilings. Um, that's up immensely from where it was. What you, you know, So it is moving higher. Um, it's constantly moving higher. Uh, so they are aware. Uh, what, what, gets it, what gets a full-blown panic? You know, it's always something that you can't anticipate. All we can focus on as investors is the conditions for, for, for much higher prices, which we think are here right now. What do you think about current contracting for some companies? For example, if we look at chemicals, contract book, Paladin, Encore Energy, UR Energy, my question is, are the potential miners that are not contracted so far at this point better play long term? You know, it, it all depends on what one's focus is, right? So uh, there are always those people say, oh, last contracting cycle, there was a uranium miner that, that uh, you know, they had no exposure. Uh, they didn't have the contract. They let it go to the moon. Well, then that worked until it didn't. And then that company got crushed, right? So it depends, you know, what somebody's expectations are for a company. Um, you know, uh, I, we, we hear often that Cameco is criticized because they have too much locked in at lower prices. You know, I, I would take the other side of that because yeah. stuff happens. You don't know. Uh, stuff happens. It's nice to have a balanced approach. You don't need to shoot for the moon. There is upside in the portfolio, um, not to get into a Cameco discussion. Um, but but yeah, I mean, you know, every everyone thinks you got to suck the last ounce out of everything. I, I think there's a nice balanced approach to do it. Some have held out because they think they'll get higher prices. Yeah. Maybe that may, maybe, maybe they will. I, I, I think prices are going much higher, but along the way, I think locking in is there's nothing wrong with that either. Right. I don't think you have to shoot the lights out and you can still crush it. So, yeah. Um, you know, but every, every company is different. Um, you know, everyone has an opinion, right. Um, as to it's how they should approach. Do. Of course. Yeah. That, that's normal. Uh, we, you touched on Niger situation. Uh, how, how how do you think uh, this will impact the uranium market uh, if they cut the future deliveries to European Union and the West? You know, I think it could be impactful, obviously, right? Because supply is already in tough can, tough shape. So just adding more pressure to an already stressed supply chain is is difficult. How it comes out, I have no, I really don't know. You know what's going to happen with the military coup in this year. Um, but I, I just think when you start to add up all the little skirmishes, you know, if you just basically say 70% of the world is of world uranium supply is produced in tough neighborhoods, right? Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Russia, Niger. I mean, it doesn't take much in a, in a scenario where it's under, we think it's undersupplied already. So, you know, it would, it would probably not be helpful for, it would, it would mean higher, it could help towards higher prices. Yeah, I got it. Um... My next question, uh, from some sources, last year we had 38 million pounds of U308 that came from a secondary supply. This year it will be around 24 million. And the projection is that by 2030, that number will, will be close to zero. I mean, do you agree with those numbers? And do you see some potential hidden sources of secondary supply? Yeah, so, you know, you know there's always it depends what makes its way out from, you know, Russia's got a few million pounds, like they, they've typically got four or five million pounds of underfeeding. I, I, it's probably not going to make its way to the West now, um, right? A few million pounds of stockpiles once in a while, that's not going anywhere. They, they need to, to feed their own beasts. They have their own reactors domestically, plus their own export reactors that they supply fuel for. Um, mixed oxide fuel, which is always, you know, around seven, eight million ish pounds, that's always going to be there. So that'll be secondary supply. Um, and then after that, it gets pretty thin. You know, you're going to need, you're probably going to see overfeeding, which is going to consume uranium, not, not produce uranium. So, 
Yeah, we think that, and, and remember a lot of times, and I don't know which one you're quoting, but a lot of times the secondary demand number shows that inventory drawdown number. It's a bullshit number. Take it out, right? So, um, because it's not a, it's not a, it's a, it comes at a price. It shouldn't be in a supply demand model. Um, uh, so yeah, you know, we think that you could, uh, you know, we, I don't have my model in front of me. We, you know, maybe 10 or 15 million pounds we'll use for secondary supply. Um, but it's, you know, that's very tiny compared to where this is, has been. Okay. Okay. Uh, what do you think about physical buyers like Spot or uh, Zuri Invest? Uh, how will they position themselves in the future? Will they stay in the current format? And at what price will they start to sell their material? What's your take on this? Uh, well, so Zuri Invest will buy or sell based on investor inflows and outflows, right? That happens in real time. So there, that's really like a, a good proxy for how investors are feeling on any given day. It gives them a price discovery method uh, and a, 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 a vehicle to express their view on any given day. Um, so that will be, my guess would be, and I have no idea, that rising prices lead to more inflows probably and, and revert, you know, converse the other way. As far as Sput goes, Sput did a wonderful job cleaning out some secondary, uh, some excess pounds that were in the market. Yeah. Um, prices have moved up this year 20% without Sput doing anything. And so really, and pretty much anything. And so, uh, you know, for those who focus on Sput as a, uh, being the next, you know, when's it going to go? I, I think Spud is a nice to have, not a need to have. It's it's great to have. Um, it's meaning for the price of uranium. The price of uranium is going where it's going to go because supply and demand is misbalanced, and utilities need uranium. Um, Spud might probably, you know, how do we think about it? Well, really rising prices probably lead to inflows into Spud. Um, it probably closes the discount that's out there. It may not, but it probably does. And if it does, we'll go buy some more uranium, which just adds to a tighter spot market. Um, you know, right, because there's two markets, spot market, which is a excess disposal market. But there's when producers produce too much pounds, there's nowhere to ship it. that goes into spot. That's really being sucked dry right now. Um, so I, where it sells, I wouldn't expect it to. So so Zuri Invest will buy and sell as the market day to day. Uh, as for Spud, I have no expectation that they sell it um, just because that's not their mandate. So yes. I wouldn't, you know, yeah. You, know. uh, you mentioned in one of your pri uh, previous interviews uh, that there is a possibility of few more physical uranium pumps. Uh, do you see it that way? I do. I, um, yeah, you know, I mean, just based on our own due diligence in the market um, and uh, <clears throat> where we spend time in the physical market and understanding what's going on. Um, you know, there are requirements to, when, when uh, uh, you're going to buy physical uranium, you need to establish a storage account that takes a few months and you, you understand, uh, you know, who's out there buying and, and looking to buy and, uh, you know, you piece together what's going on and, and, and it is not lost on people that this is an opportunity and I don't see many people talking about it. So, yeah, I, I would not be surprised to see others um, entering the market. Okay. Mike, one internal question that nobody knows the right answer. How much inventory is out there? I mean, you know, Western, there's, you know, I, I think it's the other way around this, John. Um, the, the question has always been that quoted these really high numbers of inventory for the last, since I've been looking at it. Um, uh, when I was, if you want to hear a quick story, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh 20, 2017, I think it was, I was at a, a, a large nuclear conference and I was having dinner with a large producer's chief commercial officer and uh, a producer, um, we'll just say, and um, and uh, some large, very, very large Western utilities. And I had just read an in the inventory report from the forecaster that positioned it as though there were, you know, a billion, 1.4 billion pounds of inventory out there. And um, that's every pound of inventory you could think of, fine, government stockpile, strategic, depleted, you name it. And I did the, I, I was looking through the report and I'm like, wait a second, there's like, I don't know, 500 million pounds or, using a number at that time of 180 of demand. So I was like, I don't know, there's three years, three and a half years, maybe it's four years of inventory. Um, and so we're at this dinner and 
Uh, and I'm like, look, I'm learning the industry and yada, yada. But I had read this report, spent a lot of time on it and realized that the way it was positioned was bullshit. It was that 1.4 was a bullshit number. It was strategic stockpile. It was stuff that was never going to see the light of day. What matters? Mobile inventories. Where was uranium at that time? I don't know, 20 bucks, right? So in talking to the fuel buyers, all the fuel buyers said, what are you talking? We never need to buy uranium. There's all this, and they referenced this report. And um, I said, yeah, but like, come on, time out. You, you don't believe that those are, you, some of those you, 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 to, to re-enrich them would cost so much money. The others are stockpiles that are not never going to see the light of day. And I, wor I worked it all through. I'm like, you, you, you can't be serious that you think there's all that uranium out there. And they were. And, um, and here we are, prices have moved up three and a half X. So um, where do I think? I think, your, I think your Western utilities, like I said, your Western, Western Europe, I think you're, well, you're south of three years. They want three years. I think three years or a little bit more. I think your U.S. utilities are south of two years. Remember, the fuel cycle is 18 to 24 months. They want two-ish years. You're there. So you're talking, and remember, the world is bifurcated now, right? West and East, it's, that's what's occurring in nuclear. So, you know, all of these people who say, oh, but the inventories, the inventories, I call bullshit on that. And you know what? It's time for them to prove it. Because all I know is that since we have invested in uranium, the price, as I keep saying, has gone up three and a half. This year, it's up 20%, right? And when commodities have been, been smoked. So for all those people who use inventory as a crutch, bullshit. You prove the inventories. It's, yeah. the, it's the opposite. Inventories are lower now. And if people don't like that, price discovery is telling you just the opposite. So that's what I say to those, those questions. Great story. Great story, Mike. Uh... Mm -hmm. My next question, Chinese and Kazato from relations, how do you see that segment in the future? And then would you agree that China is playing this chess game smarter than the West? Uh, I mean, in the terms of uh, locking supply for their needs. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it was easy, easier a few years ago to say, oh, look at the Kazakh supply and they're, they're going to send X into the West. They're going to sell into Western Europe. They're going to sell into the U.S. You know, they're in a tough neighborhood, right? And they have some, some, some tough neighbors. Um, who both need uranium and, and, uh, and, you know, that influence is, is probably weighs on them a little bit. And I think that the Chinese setting up a warehouse by the border, I think it's setting up trading. I mean, I think they're, um, yeah, I think that if you are a Western fuel buyer and you think that you're going to get more access to Kazakh uranium than before, I think you're, you're fooling yourself. So I, I, I think the Chinese and the Russians um, are look to Kazakhstan for a, a nice source of their uranium. Uh, everything, you know, by the way, this is John, everything we think about is on the margin. And like on the margin, things have gotten tougher on the supply front. On the margin, sources of supply for Western utilities has gotten tougher. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what's your take on SMR, uh, on SMRs, and their role in the future and their possible impact on demand supply story? Um, I think that there is, like, I think there's like 70 technologies uh, on it. Um, we're not expert on any of them. Um, it's a different beast. Um, we don't really account for anything or just a drop, a few million pounds maybe of demand in there. In our modeling, yeah, but um, say, some say there are five hundred orders right now. For could us. be, I, 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 and I, I don't. I would maybe there are. It's not important to our our thesis. It would be a cherry on top. Like, oh, yeah. look at that. That's great. Yeah. So it could very well be, um, but we're not getting into like who who could win the SMR race. I, I just think it conceptually makes sense. There's huge interest in it. It. Probably works, but we don't need it for our supply demand case. Yeah. Uh, how is your company uranium portfolio structured? I mean, uh, I know you can talk uh, names uh, of the companies, but I mean, in the terms of jurisdiction, diversification between developers, producers, uh, ETFs, uh, and explorers. I mean, you could, our filing name with the SEC our, 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 is, is Lloyd Harbor Capital Management. That's for the U.S. names, right? Yeah, the, the investment manager, our investment manager, our company is Lloyd Harbor Capital Management. The fund is Sage of Coast Special Opportunities Fund, but it's filed under Lloyd Harbor. But we only have to file for, for the U.S. listed names. 
And so there, you know, you could pull that up. And what you don't see is the other foreign names that we own, which is quite a bit. Um, uh, so we're, you know, we're, if you think about, we have our own uh, private exploration company, which is uh, in the process of it's out there, it's it's going public that, you know, that's a U.S. exploration company um, that we own a, a big chunk of, um, but it, it it's single digit percent of the portfolio. Um but still meaning, you know, not, not insignificant. Uh, and then on the, you know, on the small explorers, the ones that, you know, people look at and they're going to, Oh, they're hoping for the 20 and 50 and hundred baggers, you know, you mean, you mean lottery tickets. Yeah. They're just, I mean, we don't, our asset base is pretty big. So it's harder to buy those five, 10, 15, $20 million plays. We'd, we'd buy too much of the company. Um, but, and, and, you know, we, we just kind of view them as lottery tickets sometimes. So, uh, you know, if I think about it, and I'm uh, less than less than you know, probably mid mid to less single digits of the portfolio. Um, you know, we're, we'll take an educated guess sometimes on some of them, um, and then from there, it's it's uh, the bigger developers, bigger producer uh, producers. Um, nothing fancy, you know. Our what we, where we think our 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 view and um, our ability to to add value is really understanding the supply demand um and then trying to know what we don't know on the production side you know it's it's junior mining you got to be careful of many management teams mm -hmm. um it's, it's it's tough road right so we we tend to stick with the more developed more mature projects um which we know will sacrifice a little bit about you're not in, in, a, in a crazy bull market they're not going to go bananas but we think they'll still be really nice upside but it's, I'd say it's more conservatively positioned than aggressively positioned, but that's okay. We're fine with that. But what kind of metrics are you paying attention to uh, when doing a due diligence on those companies? What, you know, you've got to be, well, I'll tell you what, you have, you have to be careful of just the EV per pound, you know, uh, how many pounds in the ground, right? Because what companies can do is go buy a bunch of shitty pounds and say, oh, look at how cheap we are. So you just have to be cognizant of that. You know, we're looking... For the management team, have they done it before? Do they have a history of bringing a, a, a project online? Do they have a history of developing projects and selling them? Have they, do they have a history of, uh, in this commodity and other commodities, of doing it and uh, of developing it and not working, right? So that plays. Um, we're looking at uh, the, 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 the district in which it is. Um, are there opportunities around it? Um, can there, are there acquisition opportunities? You know all the stuff that you would typically look at when you're looking at anything. Where, um, but what about the what about the red flags? What keeps you away? What? Uh, shitty management teams. <laughs> um, I mean, you got to be really careful. You know, as you talk to them, uh, you know, it's now a lot of them are in motion because the prices are going up and they're going through development. But you, you know, at the different stages. You get, you know, a, a lot of these. You got to be careful of what's a lifestyle company, right? Yeah. Um, you know, how, who's just who's been entrenched there for a long time? Are they making a lot of money? Or are they, is the board making a lot of money? Is there any real progress? Um, if if not, are they doing capital raises just to generate? Are they do are they doing projects? Are they are they doing drilling just to generate news flow to get people excited to raise capital to keep the gig going for another year or two? You gotta be careful of stuff like that. Um, you know, and you, uh, so you know, you're looking for uh, you know, you can tell management team sometimes, yeah, I, I know you want to raise money and do that drilling, but nobody, the market doesn't care right now for that particular stuff, uh, and they may or may not do it. So you just gotta, you know, gotta be careful. Um, it's 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 tricky. Uh, two more questions, and then I will let you go, Mike. Uh, what would be the biggest disruptor factor or catalyst that could really push the price of uranium above 75, 80 per pound as a price that would trigger more mine restarts and uh, project developments? What do you think? I don't know. Um, I'm not. I think if you can identify a catalyst, it's probably not the catalyst. No. I think if you can identify the conditions that lead to prices that need to get there, the conditions, the supply demand conditions, 
it's normally something you didn't anticipate that gets it there. Um, so, you know, people stare at, are sanctions coming from Russia? Is it this minor? I, it just, shit happens, right? And in, especially in this world, you've got transportation issues, you've got mechanical issues, you've got uh, legal issues, you've got coups, you've got myriad things that could occur where when there's too much of stuff out there, you don't have to worry about it causing a price. But when it's on a razor's edge, and anything could lead it. It's normally the anything you hadn't thought of that that does it. So I really don't I don't know what that one thing is. Yeah. Do you see uh, the U.S. Department of Energy buying more strategic uranium? I, you know, maybe I don't know. I I think they could. I think the I, I we have been very public about this for many many years in podcasts and I don't know wherever I've spoken is the U.S. miners would always be okay if they just let the market play out. Um, meaning it, they're higher cost producers, our projects are higher. We, we think as time goes on, you're, you're in, you're, not everyone's a first quartile or second quartile producer, but we think they're gonna get to the fourth count. You know, they're gonna keep going because they need the uranium. Yeah. And so I don't know that the US buying more would be important. You know, it was, it's, it was a nice gesture um, to buy what they bought. It's not, it, it doesn't make the companies. So I think, who knows? I, it would be my answer. I, I really don't know. Okay. And what, I know from, and what I know from study, like just over the years, anytime you want to rely on the government, like good luck. It just, they will always do the, they always disappoint. Yeah. Not just uranium, uranium in everything. Uh, you got that right. Uh, one final question on uh, what other commodities are you personally bullish? If you can name three, four, or five. Yeah, I, I mean, we, you know, I, uh, we have another vehicle where we invest in other things, and, um, you know, if if you look at our holdings, uh, we we do, we're uh, offshore uh, drilling has been a, a an area where we've made a, a very nice, uh, a, a big bet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's. You know, uh, we're not of the view, we are of the view that clean energy is important. We love nuclear. We're also of the view that oil is not going anywhere tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a really long time for before that goes away. And that uh, uh, you look for conditions where even, even management teams in deeply cyclical industries can't go throw money away. And if, uh, if they wanted to, uh, and we think we see that condition in the offshore drillers and we have for some time. Uh, they've had a nice move. We think there's a lot, a lot more to it where uh, even if rising prices beget rising prices, we get rising prices because there's been so little exploration drilled offshore compared to historical levels that that's catching up to it. And you're seeing day rates go up and up and up. Even if they wanted to, for, for new build economics to make sense, prices would need to, to, to almost double, right? So that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and then even if the new build economics got to that point, the shipyard capacity doesn't really exist for them to do that. So you have very little on order. You need the economic day rates to go crazy for the new build economics to make sense. And then they got to turn around and go to the, the last cycle. The Chinese were putting people to work and they had all these shipyards. There were, I don't know, half a million people to work in shipyards, something like that. And then in the West, a, a lot of these shipyards got burnt by the last cycle. And so they don't want really any part of this. So we look at really nice conditions in that area. Um, you know, and then we look at there's some fertilizers that have been smoked here uh, that we've been buying uh, uh, down after big pullbacks. Um, you know, we, we think uh, so, some in that area is in the fertilizer space, whether it's potash or nitrogen. Um, or phosphates are, are interesting. Um, so we, we've done a, a good amount of work there. And then uh, in, in, in the oil, just general small cap oil and gas space where, you know, um, things have been beaten up and we think that there's some catalyst. So uh, yeah, we, we look there. Uh, we're not big. Oh, we don't play the big shiny, put a deck together, the EV revolution, all the battery metal stuff. We just, you know, you don't need us to find lithium or coa. We, I'm not even sure where that stuff goes. So it's more, yeah. So it's it's. I would say it's, it's oil, oil and gas drilling. You know, offshore drilling.
Mike, uh, thank you very much for being my guest. I wish you luck uh, with your uranium. Thanks, Lucy John. And uh, of course, in your private life as well. Thank you very much. Same to you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thanks thank so you. much.